Welcome to Stir It Up. Today we've got Dr. Carol Mathias O'Shea. Got the pronunciation right? Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> so Carol is the founder and lead psychologist at Thrive Care Ghana. And Carol works with several individuals and corporates, um, helping people who have mild to moderate mental health Challenge. challenges. Yes. All right. Um, Carol is a big time advocate promoting mental health and emotional support for different people. Um, she's passionate about mental health, I would say, right? And she's the founder of also Mental Health Africa. And this is one of Af Africa's first and largest online directories for mental health professionals. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Now, what is that meant to do just before I continue introducing you? This that is meant to be a one-stop shop for anyone on the continent looking for support for their mental health, okay. right? So we have um, mental health professionals in about 25 different African countries registered on there. And okay. so if you're looking for support based on your location, you can log in um, and find somebody pretty close to you also search for them based on their area of expertise, cost, um, mode of therapy, online, in person. So just you know, bridging the gap between people who are looking for mental health support on the continent and professionals. So you know where to go to. Yes, mental health. Right. <laughs> Carl is an educational psychologist and academic researcher as well. Is do you still do quite a bit of research? Um, not as much as I would like. Okay. And I've, been, I've been putting some thoughts into going and, back down that road. Going back down. <laughs> anyway, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. All right. So um, in this season, we've been talking about primary and secondary emotions. Um, and today we're going to wade through the murky waters of anger. Yeah. Let's do it. So just kind of setting context as I usually do, you know, we all carry these myths about anger, that it can't be controlled, mm -hmm. um, that only other people make you angry, mm -hmm. um, that if you ignore something that makes you angry long enough, it will go away. Um, that, you know, it's okay for a man to show anger, but not any other emotion. A woman can't show anger. Yeah. It's unladylike, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and we've been socialized to believe that anger is bad to a certain extent. But the truth is that, yes, there are certain things that are not very pleasant about anger, but if it's channeled right, it has certain positive things that come with it. Mm -hmm. So it can be motivating. Mm -hmm. um, it can drive change. Um, especially when it comes to the area of social injustice yes. and, and so on, right? Um, and it can make you a bit more assertive in your interpersonal relationships and kind of you know, influence how you show up in some of those relationships. So today we're gonna unpack it a bit, understand, answer quite a few questions around it, um, and just you know, see where the slow burn is and see where it can be destructive, but also see where it can serve us positively. Welcome. Thank you. All right. So, um, I'll start off by asking why you think a conversation about anger is important. Oh, that's a good question. I think the conversation is important because anger is one of those emotions that I think is very misunderstood. Like you just kind of, you know, it sets a great context for us. Anger is very misunderstood. I like to think of emotions, I characterize emotions in like different characters. And I often think of emotion as having like main, anger, sorry, as having like main character energy, but also be, being that, you know, family member that's very, very misunderstood, okay. right? But that's, like you said, in certain situations, they are the ones you want present. Right. There are certain situations in which we should be angry and anger serves a very positive 
um, purpose, but also very misunderstood because of how it is often expressed. Right. So anger has gotten a very bad rep. <laughs> very very bad <laughs> but it needs it needs some good is that uncle it needs some really good PR yeah. but it's important because it's one of those emotions that's present in everything anger is it's, it's not necessarily considered a primary emotion it's considered a secondary emotion but it is present a lot of the time we have a lot of human experiences that generate anger right so it's one of those emotions that we need to understand because a lot of us deal with it. And, and because it can be so aggressive in its energy, it's one of the emotions that can be very destructive. So I feel, you know, from a psychological perspective, well-being perspective, it's one of those emotions that we should have, everybody should have a really good grasp on it because it can be very destructive um, and it's also always present. So that's why I think it's important we're, we're having this conversation. Let's talk a little bit about it being always present mm -hmm. and in what ways is it always present anger is always present because there are four main things that generate anger universally right and it has to do with four basic needs we have right survival right so linked to survival we often get angry when we feel threatened Anger is very closely linked with fear. Wherever there's fear, there's usually anger. Because anger generates a very, a, a sense of sort of like power and strength and protection. So when we feel threatened or there's something harmful or threatening in an environment, we get angry. The second need that generates, very basic need that generates anger is integrity, right? And that's what you talked about when it has to do with injustice. Am I witnessing or experiencing some injustice or some wrongdoing? A lot of us get angry, you know, in the face of something like that. The fourth need that we all have that generates anger has to do with love, right? Um, and so have I been rejected? Um, have I been betrayed? Have I sort of like been abandoned by somebody that I feel intimately close or a close connection. And then the fourth need we all have that usually can generate anger is actualization. Is there something that's getting in the way of something I want to accomplish? A lot of us will get angry in response to that. So when you think about those four needs, survival, integrity, love, actualization, I don't think we can think of any sphere of our lives where those needs are, we're not constantly trying to meet those needs. And so when we're trying to meet those needs and we come up against any blocks, anger is one of the first things we're going to feel. And that's why anger is sort of like all over the place and we kind of can't get away from it. As you said that, mm -hmm. what I thought about is maybe we should define anger. Okay. And the reason why I say that is we all assume we know what anger is, mm -hmm. right? Is this discomfort is this thing that makes us unhappy about something it's the shouting it's the ranting and the raving yes. and that's probably the manifestation of it right but what is anger that's a good question anger is an emotion yeah. right an emotion like all emotions generated from a specific part of our brain to indicate something specific all emotions you can think of all emotions either as a gps system that kind of like help direct us to something that is wrong or like a messenger that has come to deliver a message about something that's wrong. So anger is an emotion and it's an emotion that's generated specifically due to certain experiences, like some of the ones we talked about, right? So injustice, rejection, unfairness, frustration, disappointment, fear, situations that create those kind of an, sort of like experiences for us generate the emotion anger. And like you rightfully said, every emotion has the feeling of an emotion, the feeling of it. That's why we sometimes call emotions feelings, right? Because there's a feeling of it, how we mm -hmm. physiologically feel it. And I'm sure we'll talk about that in a little bit, how, what anger feels like. Thank you. And then there's also the function of it. The function being that it shows up to tell you specifically that something is wrong or there's a need that's not being right. met. And then like you also said, then there's the expression of the emotion. Right, which is where I think anger gets a lot of bad. Because that's what we see. Because that's what we see. When people are feeling an emotion, how they then express it, right, with anger, that's where we see a lot of the aggression and the violence. And so people immediately put anger and violence together. But th that's the expression of the emotion, not necessarily the, the feeling of it. So that's what anger is. Okay. 
Okay. So when you think about what it is mm -hmm. versus the needs that drive it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And and let's let's even take the need for self actualization. Mm -hmm. It's I want to be something, but there are things that are preventing me from getting there. So that anger does it always show up physically? Do we always see that anger? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes I feel like well I think that it might be underneath. Right. I want to be able to build a house or I want to be able to go to America to go to school, mm -hmm. but I can't do that. Mm -hmm. And so somewhere in my body, mm -hmm. I am holding some resentment or some anger for that. But it might not be me throwing a tantrum. Absolutely. So is that where you say that there's some people who are just angry people? Yes. Yes. And I'm so glad you asked that because I think it'll connect to what you said in the beginning about gender as well. Um, so I'll, I'll say a couple of things to that. I think usually our ability to feel an emotion has to do with our relationship with our emotions, right? A lot of us, especially in this part of the world, nobody teaches us how to build a relationship with our emotions, right? Because one of the things you need to be able to do to know that anger is present, you need to be able to access your emotions. You need to be able to find you know, what the triggers are, put a finger on it and be able to name it and say, I am angry because of this and this and that. A lot of people can't do that, right? One. Two, anger has a bad rep. So a lot of people, even when they suspect they are angry, it takes a lot for people to admit that they are angry, especially women. Because we, we are, when it comes to emotions, we are, we are socialized along very gendered lines. Yes. Like you said. And anger is one of those emotions that men, especially little boys, are explicitly and implicitly kind of socialized to be very comfortable with anger. Because anger has very masculine energy. Because it's compared to a lot of other emotions, it's very aggressive. It has sort of like really strong energy. So a lot of men are very comfortable with anger. And actually, in the work that we do, we find that a lot of men use anger as their standing go-to emotion. And yet, sometimes when you sit and you dig and you dig and you dig... Might be sadness. Might be sadness or hurt, right? And they're not socialized to identify and connect with those emotions quickly because those emotions, compared to anger, are weak. Whereas women, on the other hand, we are socialized to quickly be comfortable with sadness, hurt because it's, it's vulnerable, it's softer. Fear. Fear, but anger, oh no. Grief. You said a lady, a lady doesn't get angry, right? Because it's not, it's not very gracious, right? So a lot of times that might be another reason why it may take somebody a long time to also figure out that they are angry. I can use myself as an example. I recently discovered that I'm angry about a lot of things that I thought I was sad about, mm. right? Sad or hurt, and I was actually angry but anger never felt like it was, I, I didn't feel as though anger was mine mm. or that I had a or right. Or you had a right to be angry. I had a right to be angry because, yeah, I'm a woman, I'm a therapist, right? I'm supposed yeah, to so be so Everything should be perfect. Comes in, right? So for that reason as well, it may take somebody a really long time to recognize that, huh, I'm angry. Maybe I've actually been angry for a long time. Damn. I just have been able to access it. Maybe because I can't name or access my emotions. Or maybe I've been socialized to believe that anger isn't something that should be present for me. Yeah. And also because, once again, anger, because of the kind of rep anger has, a lot of people think that if we say, oh, you are angry, then it's a bad thing. Yeah. Right? So not... for all those reasons, I think a lot of us shy or don't get to anger very quickly, even though we, are, we might be angry internally. I, I like where we've gone with this because the reality is a lot of the time off the bat, we think it's bad, right. right? But hopefully as we have this conversation, we can humanize it mm -hmm. and we can also help people navigate it better Absolutely. if they're experiencing it, whether it's as a deep emotion that is not even overtly present for other people right. to see. Right. So as we've talked about the fact that it can exist without it being physically present, I mean, it might show up in subtle ways. Right. 
I, th I think. I think it might show up in very subtle ways. But could you tell us some of those subtle ways? Well, we all know people who are maybe passive aggressive. Right, which is a form of anger. Okay. And it's usually a form of anger when people feel as though, yes, I can't express, or I may not have an awareness that I'm angry, but like every emotion, it has to find release. So it will, even if you're unaware of it, it'll find ways to kind of like creep up to the surface, right? So one of those ways, you know, in terms of what you're describing, is people who are very passive aggressive, right? Because they, they are doing everything they can to maybe suppress the anger, but then the anger is also fighting to, to, come out. to come out. So then you get people who do passive, we all know people who do passive aggressive things. Either they pass you know, snipe comments, comments or they give certain looks or they, they create situations that are very uncomfortable for people or they take delight in witnessing other people kind of like, you know, people's discomfort and, and things like that. So passive aggressiveness is one of the common ways in which uh, like anger rises to the surface without you acknowledging it. Okay. So maybe let's talk a bit also about other different types of anger. Oh yeah, there are several different types of anger, okay. plenty. But I think the three most common ones, right? Okay. Passive aggressiveness. <laughs> and that's very, very common. Yeah. And guess, guess oh, which okay. gender, guess which gender is more, to be more passive aggressive. On the face of it, I would have said women, mm -hmm. but based on my experience, I think men are more passive aggressive. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a bit of a balance. Yeah. Like pe people generally think, oh, because women are uncomfortable expressing anger, they tend to be passive aggressive. But men too are very, very passive okay. aggressive. Right, so there's passive ag aggressive. There's no, but tell me, which is it a fair balance? It's, or? it's, it's a pretty fair balance. I think it's a fair it's balance. A, it's yeah. a pretty fair balance. Yeah. But most people, right, like you said, will think, oh, women. Yeah. Right, and and, and I think it's, it's one of the things that we also tag. Also <laughs> unfairly. But men are also very, very passive Passive aggressive. aggressive. But so that there's passive aggressiveness. There's also just pure aggression. Okay. Aggressive anger, which is, you know, the the anger that we, we see all the time. So like how anger has been yeah. packaged for us to see, which is this, you know, strong, aggressive, antagonistic, I'm angry, so you're gonna know immediately through my actions, my words, loud, violence, that kind of anger. And then there's assertive anger, right? Which is when people who have gotten to the point where they have a certain level of awareness of their anger, they have pretty good self-regulation when it comes to their anger. And so, you know, through being angry, though, might be seeking out solutions, you know, have figured out a way to, you know, assertively state their position and their anger on something, but it you not know, maybe be as destructive as aggressive or passive aggressive. Anger. Okay. So we've talked about the things that cause anger, right? right? Are there things that trigger it? Oh, absolutely. Um, when you think about... And, and, and maybe let's, let's, let's define what a trigger is, okay. right? Just, just, I'm sure a lot of people know, but let's, let's just go for it. A trigger is anything, anything at all. And, and, and a lot of people think a trigger is often something you see or experience or hear, right? But it could be anything. A trigger could be a smell. A trigger could be, you know, the feel of something. A trigger could be a song. Anything that reminds you or takes your mind back to a place where something harmful or distressful or uncomfortable was happening to you when you experienced that, right? Um, and so when we talk about things that trigger anger, once again, going back to the causes, the things that signal to our brain that maybe, you know, there's some harm that's about to be done to us, there's some injustice happening, um, we're being rejected or, you know, abandoned in some way, or there's something in our way, get you know, preventing us from achieving something we want to achieve, right? So a trigger could be something as simple as something somebody says, right? That communicates, you know, a sense of injustice okay. or a sense of maybe insults to your person, yeah. right? Um, um, a trigger could be something as simple as a situation that you witness, right? Um, I'll tell you something really, really, really silly that I did. I was driving. <laughs> I was driving through Lamami. Yeah, I know Lamami well. I, 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 I have a girl who, who who twists my hair in Lamami. For something in 
La Mami. So I was driving through La Mami. And you know La Mami, the way it is when you're driving, like you have to be paying attention because the people crossing, there are all kinds of things happening, yeah. right? And Heightened I'm, awareness. Heightened awareness, I'm driving. And then I see this gentleman um, just beating up a little girl. Like he, he was an older man and she must have been maybe a teenager, 12, but there was no way, you know, she could fight back, back. right? And just seeing that, like I was, it triggered anger. I got so angry that I didn't think. I parked my car in the middle of the road and I got out. And the first thing I could think about was to go to the back of my car and get like the little jack. <laughs> because I'm like, how am I going to fight this big oh man? Yeah. And so then I go and grab it and like I'm approaching this man. And then some young men are like, I'm maybe not happy. Like, what, what are you going to do? And then they came around and kind of like also, you know, attended to the situation. But that was a trigger, right? Because I was witnessing something that in my head was like, what? What's this? What's, What's going on here? Why are yeah. you beating on this little girl? So things like that can serve as a trigger. Things that people say, um, memories, right? If you mm. remember past things that happened, that can serve as a trigger. Um, sometimes the way people treat you may not even be words, but maybe you walk into a room and, and the way somebody they look, at you. look at you or somebody just completely ignores you, right? That can serve as a trigger. Somebody doing something you consider pretty insensitive, Right, yeah. can serve as a trigger. Somebody forgetting something that maybe is important to you that you thought they would remember can serve as a trigger. Right, so anything at all that signals to our brain that either we are being disregarded, there's injustice, we're not being treated fairly. You would we're not talking, safe. We're not safe. There might be some harm in, or some harm has been done to somebody we care about. Right, a lot of people get really angry when people they are closely intimately related to or connected to, right? Experience some of those same things, right? So harm to a child or a partner that we care about, mm -hmm. all of those things can, can trigger anger. You know, when I have a lot of smell memories. Ah, yeah. Right? Smell is powerful. I never knew that. Smell is so powerful. Right, um, but I, I, when I smell something, it can take me down a certain line. Sometimes it's just even old cloths, mm -hmm. like old cloths remind me of my grandma, yeah. Yeah. right? Where, or or um, a, a cologne will remind me of someone, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. And things like that are very, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't think it was a thing till I started experiencing it as a teenager, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, smell is powerful. Okay. So now, we know why you get angry. Mm -hmm. We know what triggers you to kind of begin to feel anger in yeah. the moment. Yeah. Um, hopefully we will not be parking in the middle of the room. <laughs> but I get it. I saw red. <laughs> I get it, right? <laughs> when you are angry in the moment, yeah. Yeah. What do you feel? Feel. Oh, What's, what are the point. sensations, that's right? What point. tells your mind and your body and your being? That I'm mad. That you're angry. Good. Uh, uh, thank you for that question. Um, anger, together with fear, you know, they are considered stress emotions, right? They're the two main emotions that generate a flight or fight response in our central nervous system. So when you get angry, your body gets ready to fight okay. or flee, right? Okay. And so your heart works really really fast pumping blood okay. to everywhere things you might need you might need blood so one of the first things you notice or one of the first things that's a physiological um signal of anger is an increased heart rate okay right because your, your body your heart just starts working really really fast and so then you might also start to sweat right you might start some people start to feel like a tingling in their extremities okay. right um some people might get an instant headache Right. And then there's also this thing about, we've heard this phrase, I got so angry, I saw red or I was blind. Right. Usually when people say that what they mean is a sense of sort of like fogginess when it comes to their present reality. Right. And usually what's happening there, it's, it's not actually a clinical thing that's happening. It's more of a colloquial term. But essentially what's happening is it's kind of like your body has gone into over overdrive because of the the rush of such a you know emotion that has such strong energy and you've kind of like moved over from rational thought to irrational Rational emotional thought, thought. Yeah. so one of the things that people also notice when they are angry is that there's a fogginess i can't think some people even tell you they cannot see or remember what was in the room 
when they were angry. Or when they were angry, because your mind does this thing where it zones in on the focus or the cause of the anger mm -hmm. and kind of like can't see anything else, right? Got it. So in addition to increased heart rate, sweating, um, agitating, some people feel a tightness in yeah, their chest, chest um, tingling in their fingers, sort of like seeing red, not being able to focus. All of those things indicate anger. Okay. Some people also feel it in their gut. The thing that every emotion shows up in your guts because there's a direct link between our gut and our central nervous system which is a central nervous system is a place where that tries to regulate everything. Everything passes through there. And so we feel almost every emotion too in our, in our gut. Tell me a bit more about how you feel these emotions in your gut. Well, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. When we've been angry, afraid, everyone can relate, almost everyone can relate to this. When, think about the time when you've been angry, you've been afraid, you've been anxious, You've been sad. You run instantly. You run. <laughs> like, and you know, sometimes you're looking back and you're like, I haven't, what have I eaten? Yeah. I haven't eaten anything bad. Mm -hmm. Everybody else in the house is the same thing. Why am I running? Sometimes it's, it's, it's emotions. Or if you if you don't run, your tummy might just be unsettled. Yeah. Right? One of the big things, one of the big things in the clinical world now is, you know, when people say, oh, this person who is fishing gives me butterflies. Right? Butterflies in my tummy. There's a big belief now that that's anxiety. Right. Um, or, or your body kind of maybe trying to tell you that there might be something about this situation exactly. that yeah. isn't great. So those are some of the ways we experience emotions mm -hmm. in our, in our yeah. gut. Yeah. Okay. So what, what, one, one question is that lack of control. Mm -hmm. Does that show up when you're angry? Yes. Okay. Yes, but I'm sure we'll talk about that. Okay. Because it's, it's one of the reasons why anger has a bad rep. Um, because a lot of people really do experience it as when I go into this place, I can't control myself. Self, yeah. But that's usually because you haven't practiced in terms of self-regulation and, and having a certain level of, of confidence around doing that. But yes, yeah. a lot of people when they are in a state of anger, once again, because of that crossover from rational thought to irrational emotional state, there's a sense of a lack of control. And, you know, remember I said, like, energy has been, um, anger has main character energy. Anger is very overwhelming. Very, very, it's one of those emotions, it's, it's heavy. Yeah. And once, once it shows up, it takes, it takes over completely. And that's what gives people a sense of, I don't have any control when I'm angry. Okay. I think we've answered this a bit in, in, in little bits and bobs already. But I want us to talk a little bit more about why anger has this destructive or negative rep, right? Mm -hmm. um, but putting it within certain contexts, right? So within the work context, mm -hmm. how does anger impact you as a leader, as a colleague, as a subordinate? Mm -hmm. I mean, pick any one of them, but how does you have an attempt or you having been angry about something. No, you have an attempt actually. How does you being angry about something impact you within the work context? That's a good question. I think the first thing is anger, when we say anger blinds us, what it does is it takes us further and further away from being able to think and process rationally. Okay. Right. And in any work environment, one of the things that you need to be able to do, right, is engage a lot of the work we do, we're primarily engaging with the rational part of, of, of our brain and mm -hmm. rational thoughts. And so an inability to do that, right, is likely to impact you, whether you're a leader, whether you are, you know, as an, uh, and a subordinate, whatever, a business owner, right? Not being able to think things through rationally um, is likely to, to impact you. That's mm -hmm. one. Two, anger also definitely impacts how we relate and communicate with people yes right? and i'm sure we've all had this experience where when you're talking to somebody who's angry you know right and sometimes you can't put your finger on okay is it something that i have done or are they just angry you know, angry and so it definitely shows up in communication as well so if you have a leader who maybe has some unprocessed anger mm -hmm. is unaware of it you know it's definitely likely to transfer yeah. um that anger down to, to, to the people that, that they are responsible for, Understood. right? And then think about what kind of environment and culture that creates, right? If, if there's unprocessed anger, unacknowledged anger, and we're all just kind of like 
moving. So definitely, I think it inhibits your ability to think rationally. And when we talk about that, we're thinking about just, you know, higher order thinking when it comes to analyzing things, being able to be, you know, neutral and see things in an objective way, way. Um, being able to focus and content. When we are angry, it's really hard to focus on, on the thing that isn't the object of our anger. Right. So it impacts all of those cognitive abilities, one. And then it also definitely impacts how we are relating to each other, right? Whether it's regardless of the power dynamic, right? Um, so I think th those are two specific ways that it can impact any work um, situation. The next one would be parents. Mm. Oh. How does it influence our relation mm. with our parents? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a good one, yeah, because I'll tell you. In a lot of the work that we are I angry do, with our parents. We are angry with our parents. <laughs> There's so much anger. Yeah. And it's interesting. The anger doesn't come, some of the anger comes from a lot of the ways in which our parents failed us, right? By not doing some of the things that they were supposed to do, right? And the rest of the anger comes from people feeling as though they don't have the space or the right or the grace to even admit that and say that publicly, mm -hmm. right? Because to say that is to then say that my parent was a bad parent. Yeah. And especially in an African context, how dare you? How dare how you dare say that? I you, raised you, I raised you, I fed, I fed you, you, I, I put sent you to school, yeah. good schools, right? So then if I didn't teach you how to regulate your emotions, or if I didn't do conflict in a healthy way for you to see, or I didn't create a, a situation in the home where you could talk about your emotions, how does that make me a bad parent? Yeah. And so you won't Because I probably that. didn't even know I how. I didn't know how. I didn't know how, right? So when it comes to how we are relating to our parents, a lot of people are angry and the anger is, you know, magnified because they don't even know what to do with okay. it, right? I have people sit on the couch and say, almost ask like, is it okay for me to say it? Yeah. And sort of like even have sometimes a physical reaction to eventually being able to say, I'm so angry with my mom. I'm so angry with my dad and not feel as though, okay, it's okay to admit that. It doesn't make them a bad parent. You're just acknowledging the ways in which maybe they, they failed you. So I think that definitely shows up a lot in parent-child, adult pa parents and adult-child relationships. relationships. Um, because, because of that power dynamic, most children never get to the point where they feel as though they can tell a parent or even tell other people that they are angry with their parents. And sometimes the anger isn't even about what parents did and didn't do in relation to them. Can I tell you what it is? What's that? It's about how they're handling it now. How they're handling it now. <laughs> and also for a lot of women, for example, they talk about being angry with their mom for putting up with so many toxic, uh, relationships. Stuff. Yes. Because then it trickles down to, okay, this is why I have difficulty sort of recognizing what's healthy and, and what's not. Yeah. I saw you, this was modeled for me. Mm -hmm. And then yes, how they are doing it now, mm -hmm. right? Because Cause you don't accept. Uh, so so I'll, I'll tell you a bit about some of my views on, mm -hmm. on that, mm -hmm. right? I, I think that a lot of the things that happen with parents, they don't know better yeah. at the time, yeah. right? But as you evolve, you might begin to know better. Mm -hmm. And when you know better, there's a need to sometimes show up a little differently. And it might be acknowledging some of those things or even to being willing to have the conversation. Yes. But there's not always the ability to hold the space and say, you know what, I could have handled this differently, yeah. right? Because then I, I think that maybe the view might be that I failed you and that admission is a bit too heavy for a parent sometimes, right? Yeah. Um, but you're right. It's things like, why did you stay for so long? Yeah. And your staying meant that my view of what a relationship is, is ABC, but that's not healthy. Right. Right. And even now, you can't admit that. Yes. And the conversation is, I did it for you. Did. No, you didn't do it for me. You did it because yeah. you're worried about society. Yeah. Yeah. Or you did it because you thought that was the right thing to do, but yeah. it wasn't. You know. So in that relationship, there's a lot of anger, like that parent-child relationship. What do you tell people who are feeling that? 
in service mm -hmm. of recultivating that relationship? Mm -hmm. I think one of the main things I tell people is to work towards getting to a point where they can acknowledge it, right? Because a lot of people can't even get through the acknowledgement bit because of some of the things we talked about, yeah. right? Because of just a sense of guilt, because of fear, because of what they think it might mean. Just being able to acknowledge, You're ungrateful. say out loud, right? That, you know, I'm angry at you is, is one of the major hurdles we work towards, right? And, it, and, and one of the ways we help people do that is to help them understand that feeling and experiencing and holding two seemingly contradictory things is possible. Right. I love, I you, love you, but I feel hurt I by feel, this. Yes. And one doesn't cancel out the other. Mom and dad, you were, you showed up amazingly when it came to these things. And you didn't when it comes to this. And sort of like getting to the place where you can allow those two things to be true. Because when that is, then you can really start to do the work of, okay, now that I can acknowledge that this anger is there, what else? Then I can go to the next step of acknowledging the ways in which it's impacted me and I can actually start to do something about it, right? But it's hard. It's I'm... really, really hard. Because, you know, a parent-child relationship is, is, it is the most intimate, boundaryless. <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> um, relationship, but it's also one of those relationships that when it's healthy, can be, you know, fulfilling one of the most and Powerful resources you have. Yeah. So we've talked about it from par with our parents. Yes. But can we talk about it also from raising kids uh -huh. as, as a parent, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. That's wonderful. Because a lot of people who come to wanting to work through the anger they have towards their parents are doing it because they want to be, they better. Don't, they want to be better. They don't want... I had somebody say to me, I don't want my son to ever be sitting in front of a therapist like you and telling me, telling you how angry they are at me. So what do I need to do? So definitely then thinking about, okay, but, but here's the thing. I think with all emotions, it's important that parents are modeling for their children how to access those emotions, how to feel, release, express, acknowledge in healthy ways. Right. So we're talking about anger, so we can talk about this. For the longest time, there was a belief that it wasn't good for children to witness conflict. Right. Mm -hmm. I never, somebody said, I never saw my parents fight. I don't know if that's a good thing. Because you need to learn how to conflict to, to solve, to solve right? conflict. Yeah. You need to, and you know, most people then are afraid of conflict because it was never modeled for them in terms of, okay, conflict is a part of life. It happens. You can have healthy conflict. You can have anger expressed in a healthy, productive way. And then you can have resolution to that conflict, right? So a lot of parents think, I cannot fight in front of my child. Well, why not? I mean, of course, we're talking about a certain kind of fight, right? Not like... Like a disagreement. A disagreement. Yeah. Healthy disagreement where everyone is passionately or maybe even angrily stating their case, but still doing it, you know, in an environment that feels safe. And then the kids see that, okay, things can be resolved even when you're angry, right? So it's important to think about how am I modeling, especially anger, right? And my relationship with anger for my children. Do my children see me get angry? Do they know that it's okay to get angry? Do they know that actually in some situations you should be angry? There are certain situations people tell us about, and as soon as they tell us and we recognize they are not, and by us I mean um, like therapist, right? yes. and you're not angry, we're usually like, why are you not angry? This is a situation in which everybody, every healthy brain should, should be, be angry. angry. So your children knowing that it's okay to be angry, there are some situations that yeah, actually you should be angry. Anger is the only healthy response to this situation. However, there are ways to see how I regulate it, see how I talk about it. When dad is angry, maybe he'll go for a run. So like all these ways in which we model you know, anger in a healthy way for our children. But also to let go of the idea that you will do parenting so perfectly that your child will never end up in front of a therapist. Um, I don't know if that exists. I have been told <laughs> that if I end up in therapy, no, it's because of this. I said... <laughs> <laughs> right. It, it doesn't mean that you're not parenting well. I know. But I think yeah. like anger and every emotion, I think for me, the crux is model it in a healthy way 
for your child. And if that means that you need to go and help, get help to, in order to get your self-regulation and emotional regulation in a better place, Please. then that's what you need, need to, to do. do. The next one is with a partner. That's another one. Um, How does it impact the quality of your relationship? Oh, once again, into like well, anger. Anger is one of those emotions that make it difficult for us to be intimate and vulnerable. If you think about um, physically, anger is like a wall between two people, mm -hmm. right? And in in a, in a, in, a, in a partnered relationship, right? One of the one of the main features is is vulnerability and closeness and intimacy. And when we are angry, whether it's with our partners or we are carrying anger from so many other spheres in our lives, um, it's, it makes it impossible for us to be as intimate and as vulnerable with our partners as we need to be. Because anger generates a sense, once again, of fight, flee, um, respond. So when, and, and it's like a heightened state. So it makes it really difficult for you to relax and go into vulnerable spaces, right? So it can literally be a wall between two people. That's one. So it can impact intimacy and your ability to be vulnerable. It can it can blind you to some of what to, to, to it, it can blind you to being objective, right? And sometimes in relationships we need to be able to be objective to say this is where I need to take ownership of stuff. This is where you need to take ownership of stuff. The other thing it can definitely impact is once again communication. Right, because if I'm angry, the way in which I may say something when I'm angry, right, versus the way in which I may say when I'm not angry. Because a lot of times when somebody's angry and they are telling us something, all we see is the anger. We don't hear the message. Hear the message. Even if the message is valid, even if what they have to tell you is valid, um, all I see is your anger. And so that can definitely impact how partners communicate and whether or not partners are even hearing each other and communicating effectively, right? And then definitely when we talk about intimacy and vulnerability, it can impact your sex life. Some people say, oh, angry sex is, is, is great sex. And, and maybe so. But think about... How, Are you always going to have angry thank sex? Thank you. How, how long can, can you sustain, <laughs> sustain that for? Yeah. Right? So I, I don't know if there's an area of, you know, relationships or intimate relationships that anger doesn't sort of like impact if we're not handling it yeah. in a healthy way. How would you help a couple mm -hmm. if there are two things you do to help a couple that's mm -hmm. navigating a lot of anger mm -hmm. or have this big giant maybe war. An anger towards each other yeah um whether it's towards each other or it's anger from other parts that but it's affecting their it's relationship affecting their relationship um the first thing is i think getting each individual to take some time take some space to really sit with the anger and think about what exactly am I angry about? Why am I angry? Does this anger feel familiar? Is this a pattern? Just sitting with it, right? And by sitting with it, possibly, you know, having individual conversations, right? Either with therapists, whoever, to figure out why I am angry, right? Because a lot of times when couples are trying to work through something together, one of the things that acts as a block is that as individuals, they haven't figured out how exactly they are navigating it as an individual, right? So they need to figure that out before they can come to the table to talk to each other about it. So the first thing would be, listen, as individuals, sit with the anger, figure it out, and then also then equip them with tools to be able to communicate with the anger present. Because anger, like all emotions, you can't, it's not a switch, Right. Even after we acknowledge anger is present, it doesn't go away. It doesn't it's go still away. Very present. Yeah. It could be latent. It could just be. And you have to work your way through it. So then equipping them with the tools to then be able to communicate even in the presence of anger. But one thing about communication, I'm a big believer in when you are angry, a lot of times it is not the best time to try and have a conversation. Yeah. Right. Because once again, there might be yelling, there might be, you know, really intense you know, emotions that are expressed in unfavorable ways, that makes the message of what we are communicating completely lost. lost. So take a moment, regulate, and then come back to the conversation. Okay. Let's do some myths. Okay, yeah. Because I'm doing a lot of myths throughout these conversations around emotions. Good, good, good. Um, when someone cries, Sometimes tears are a sign of anger. Oh, yes. Okay. That's true. That's okay. very true. And I'll tell you why. Tears, when, when anger shows up, there's often frustration in there. 
mm-hmm. right? And and anger, anger is closely linked with frustration. And sometimes frustration about the fact that I have so much anger, I cannot express it. I don't feel as though I can express it in a way where to be validated. And so a lot of times you see tears. Okay. So, yeah. A person's anger is always caused by someone else. Oh, no. No, absolutely. I think we can make ourselves happy. <laughs> we can wind ourselves <laughs> we can up. Wind, oh, we wind ourselves up all the time without recognizing it, right? Unhealthy patterns of behavior, um, boundaries we need to set that we are not setting, the ways in which we are constantly talking to ourselves. Think about if there are things people can say to you that make you angry, pause and think about your own inner dialogue, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes you are constantly saying those things to yourself. Yes. Um, that, that can generate anger, right? So we can definitely make ourselves angry. Okay. It's not a waste on somebody else. Um, anger is a masculine emotion. We've talked about that a bit already. So the, just let me, no, 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 no. No, no, no. Right? No, no emotion is, is masculine or, or feminine, but we are, definitely, we are definitely socialized to be more comfortable along gender lines when it comes to certain emotions. Suppressing anger is healthy? Oh, no. No, 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 no. Suppressing (laughs) any emotion is unhealthy, right? Because emotions are supposed to be transitory. Once again, they are supposed to, like a GPS system, they are supposed to guide us to something that we need to attend to, and then we are supposed to be able to give the emotion release. A lot of people, unfortunately, are suppressing emotions, including anger, and thinking they are regulating well. Right. Mm-hmm. If 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 you are suppressing and you haven't sat with the emotion, you haven't explored the emotion, you haven't figured out what the emotion is trying to tell you, you haven't done something to release it, then likely you are suppressing. Right. Being the kind of person who says, "Oh no, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. I'm okay. I don't want to talk about it. I'm good." Uh, you're probably suppressing. So no, we, we with every emotion, especially anger, because anger has very strong energy. You you want to be able to release and not hold on. I, I want you to tell us a bit about sitting with emotions because okay. I've been told, sit with it, feel it, yeah. acknowledge it, yeah. and then work through it, yeah. right? Yeah. What does that mean? Exactly that. Sitting with an emotion is like, I'm sitting with you, right? So something has made me angry, or I'm not even sure that as anger I'm feeling, right? Sit with it. Start to ask, explore by asking questions, right? First of all, the first place to go is our bodies. Our bodies instantly tell us. Our bodies don't lie. Our our brain can take information and kind of like manipulate it, but physiologically your body will not lie. So look out for certain signs. And and maybe I can share this with you and you can share it with your viewers. There there's you know there are lots of documents that outline clearly what physiological reactions tell you what emotion you're feeling. When it comes to anger, we talked about some of them, like the increased heart rate, the sort of like desire to maybe clench certain parts of your body, um, sweating. There are very specific things that will be happening to your body that will give you a hint at what emotion it might be. Mm -hmm. So sitting with it is trying to figure out what emotion is this? What am I feeling? Right? Ask questions. Why am I feeling this? If if, If I conclude that it's anger, I need to acknowledge it. If we are emotions are like, I like to joke about this. Emotions are like, you know, like in Ghana, we like protocol stuff, mm-hmm. right? And you go to an event and sometimes if, if you don't observe all protocols, you can get into trouble, mm-hmm. right? Emotions like to be acknowledged. Right? They like protocols. They like protocols. If you don't acknowledge them, they will worry you until you acknowledge them. And that's why acknowledging is such a big part of processing because you have to be able to get to a point where you acknowledge and say, I am angry, I am sad, I am hurt, but I am angry. You've acknowledged it, and then you start to think about why am I angry? What was present, or what did I experience? What did I just witness? Whether it's with somebody else or by myself, that made me angry. All of that is sitting with it. You're exploring, you're acknowledging, you are validating, right? Acknowledging is one thing. Acknowledging is saying this thing is here. Validating is saying it has a right to be here. So I am angry and being able to say to yourself, I have a right to be angry because this person did this and this and this to me. Once you've done that, right, and you figured out what it is, because emotions show up in order for us to be able to take action. So one of the things you then need to do is think about, okay, is there some action I need to take 
in response to this. I'm angry because this person did this. Is there a conversation I need to have with them? Is this something that happens often? Is there a pattern of repeated behavior? Is there a boundary I need to set? Whatever that action might be. And then you need to do something to release the anger. And the, the reason why release is important is our bodies feel their emotion and hold, it. and hold it. So we have to do something to release. And that's why usually, it's not the only way to release, but physical activity is a good way to release, especially yeah. anger, because it comes with so much energy. And that's why a lot of people release anger by doing something vigorous, right? Either running or boxing or, you know, hitting something, not somebody else, but like get, getting that energy out. Yeah. Um, but then release is an important part of sitting with it. So that's what it means to sit with your emotions. Explore, acknowledge, validate, find the message that the emotion has come to give to you. Take action if you need to, and then release. And then, this is the part we don't like to talk about. If you've made a decision to release it, then you have to commit to not bringing yourself back around to it constantly. Yeah. And one of the ways we do that is we keep talking about it. Right. If somebody does something or a situation makes you angry, you can't avoid not talking about it at all. But as much as possible, don't let that be the thing that now, every time you sit down with somebody, you're going back to talk Good. about it. Because it gives it life. It gives it life, right? And the, the emotions, they like attention. So the more... The more Protocols. The more, the more attention you are giving it, why should it go anywhere? That's what to go. It's like you've invited it in, you've given it a seat, it's on the couch, you've, you've given, given it, it a, a drink, a cocktail. And drink. Um, it does not want to go anywhere. So once you've processed it and sat with it, now you need to think about making it uncomfortable so that it leaves. And one of the things you can do is to not talk about it, right? Okay. And sort of keep talking about it. One of the things that you said that I would like to circle back to mm -hmm is just this, uh, around sitting with it. When you don't process the emotion and you don't sit with it and go through these stages that we've just talked about, does that, is that likely to drive recurrence of mm. a, a recurring impact in whether it's relationships or yes. scenarios that happen in your life? Yeah, absolutely. Oh. Absolutely. You can think about it as maybe stacking. We, we have this term in psychology called stacking, which is, so something happens. I get angry about it. I don't go through the process we've just talked about. Mm -hmm. It's like you push a box into a corner, right? Something else happens. You put that box on top of that box, on top of that box, on top of that box. You know, we usually say soon enough that that box, oh, that, it, it, it'll, it'll come tumbling now. So it definitely has a compounded effect when you're not processing. Um, and, and the more compounded it gets, the more it fights to have release. And so you'll find yourself maybe, you know, engaging in, in, in unhealthy <laughs> behavior sometimes as a result of unprocessed anger okay. or passive aggressiveness or just sleep. Sleep is one of the things that's impacted, just a lack of your, your, your body. Think of it as a processing plant, right? Or, or just of us who have juices, right? If, if the machine is kind of like stuffed with so much stuff that is in processing out, right? Our bodies experience that as just an inability to regulate. So your central nervous system is overworked with all this stuff and there's, there's an inability for you to be at peace, right? Because there's all this stuff there that you haven't processed and surely it'll come out in how you're relating to every body. Yeah. Cause it's like you're literally carrying all this stuff yeah. around, yeah. right? Okay. So the next one will be around anger leads to bitterness. Mm, bitterness is an interesting concept. That I think is true. Um, because I think unprocessed anger settles it definitely settles in your body. And by bitterness, I can only think of bitterness, you know, through a lens of it leading to certain patterns of behavior. Okay. Right. So then if I am angry and I don't process and deal with it, right, then I sort of pack it away and it becomes this thing that I keep referring to or a lens through which I keep engaging the world in a negative lens, right? So maybe somebody does something to me, I don't process and let it go. Then I become this person who starts to believe that, well, everybody will do something, like everybody will, will, offend, will you. offend you. Then somebody even comes to tell you about their issue and you're quick to go, mm, 
men dear, that's how they yeah. are. <laughs> we label everybody. <laughs> or women dear, that's how they mm, are. They are wicked. Or they only in, want your money. <laughs> mothers in law dear, that's how they, they are. are. Right? That is a sign that there's stuff there that you haven't dealt with. And so it has started to become just basically, yeah, the lens through which you see. It becomes a bias. A, a bias. You cannot see anything outside of, of that lens. Right. And so, yeah, anger, anger can lead to bitterness in that sense. Definitely. Okay. Unprocessed anger. Yeah. Um, yes, so I guess it's unprocessed, yeah. So let's talk about the long-term effects of anger mm. on our physiology, on our minds, on our emotions, you know. And the reason why I want to talk about this is it's one of those emotions that, like we said, there's a physical manifestation, but there's also a lot of impact on our being and our yeah. person. Yeah. And you've already even given an example where you talked about how when it's unprocessed it's you can't it affects your sleep right so are there any other things that when your anger is unprocessed how it impacts you as a person oh heart disease <laughs> <laughs> if 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 you are always, <laughs> oh, what, you get blood pressure right i'm happy to, like because because of once again like we explained when you are angry all the time your heart is working double, triple, constantly just pumping blood um, because it thinks you're getting ready to fight fight somebody all the time and just heightened state of... So it's definitely been linked to, you know, heart disease, high blood pressure. It's also been linked to stroke, right? Um, because of all the tension and the stress. Mm -hmm. anger, is, anger is hard on our bodies. It's one of those emotions that's really, really worse and tears our bodies down because it's so strong. Um, so definitely heart disease, high blood pressure. It's also been linked to stroke. It's been linked to anxiety, right? And I think that's where the sleep comes in. Anger makes us very anxious, right? And, and also there are definitely stress levels. Um, and a lot of, you know, there are people who tell you they constantly have stress headaches, right? That has also, headaches have also been linked to, you know, just constant or unprocessed anger, as well as gut and digestion, um, issues. I think. I think with that one, any unpleasant emotion that you know you're constantly dealing with and not processing will lead to gut issues. But the research definitely highlights, you know, heart disease, high blood pressure, stroke, headaches, um, anxiety, um, as being linked to to anger. And then, how does it impact your relationships? Well, I think. Anger, anger definitely makes it hard for you to truly connect in an intimate, vulnerable way, right? And when it comes to certain kinds of relationships, vulnerability and intimacy, it's impossible to do those relationships without vulnerability and intimacy. And then unfortunately, if you're the kind of person also who, and how you express your anger, you haven't gotten a healthy hold of it, right? Nobody wants to be around you or people become afraid of you, right? Because of how volatile um, you are because of your anger, right? So it's, it's likely to yeah, isolate you and keep people away from you or have people walk on eggshells around you or have people not be honest with you. We all know people that we are afraid to tell the truth or tell something to because we are afraid of, the reaction. of, of their reaction. Yeah. Okay. Are there people who are predisposed or people who are prone to being quick-tempered? Um, I don't know if there is a predisposition from a purely biological standpoint. I think there's a predisposition based on nurture. So because we are a combination of nature, nature and, and nurture. nurture. Right, and by nurture, once again, it goes back to what was modeled for you in your early years, you know, your, your, who your primary caregivers were. Okay. How did they model sort of like their relationship with anger? If you grew up in a home where maybe the person you're looking to, to show you how to do life was quick to get angry, you might grow up thinking, okay, that is... I know people who say you know, they, they saw their father use anger to just get things done, 
because people were afraid of him because of his anger. So it was I very know, effective. I, I know someone like that. Yeah, My dad. <laughs> <laughs> so then if that is modeled for you, it'll seem like a predisposition because right from childhood, you know, anger becomes an emotion that you are very comfortable with. You go too quickly, you sort of wield it as a weapon. So I think it's more, the predisposition will come more from a nurture angle in terms of if, if that was the environment you grew up in where anger was very present, then you might you might go to anger very, very quickly. However, there are also some people for whom ah, the opposite is true, right? Um, uh, from a nurturing perspective, an environment can make somebody predisposed to anger when it's not present at all, so, right? People who grew up in homes where <laughs> it's like, there's a problem, but there's no problem. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Sunday, yeah, she's an event. Don't talk about anything. We don't talk about anything. Somebody, we know somebody's upset, but we don't talk about they it. Pretend. They pretend. Pretend. There are a lot of people who are angry, right, because of that. And so have a need to know. Because we didn't, I grew up in this kind of household. We didn't talk about things. Me went there. I won't talk about it. No, 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 no. Yeah. Right? And, and in that sense, from a nature perspective, it, it can make us predisposed yeah. To, yeah. to just being really comfortable with anger. And, and it's even some of that's even from how conflict was resolved so by true. parents, yeah. right? And, yes. Absolutely. and yeah, Absolutely. I get that. Absolutely. Okay. So now we know you, you, you're angry. Mm -hmm. How long should a bout of anger last yeah. for mm -hmm. before reconciliation comes about, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because I find that, you know, are you going to be angry for 24 hours, 48 hours? Or are you able to regroup and come back and have a conversation? Mm -hmm. Even if there is no complete reconciliation, mm -hmm. how long does it take, should it take? Mm -hmm. Or what's the time window mm -hmm. for the, there to be some form of decent engagement mm -hmm. post some disagreement mm -hmm. or angry spats between two people? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Because as I'm listening to the question, I'm thinking about the number of times people have said to me that they struggle with that because of that. It's a verse in the Bible, right? That talks about not letting... Don't the let the sun go down mm -hmm. on your anger. Yeah. Right, which which makes it somebody asks me yeah, so <laughs> if I get angry two minutes before <laughs> <laughs> the sundown. <laughs> what do I do? Right. Um so that that's a really good question. Yeah. I think much like all things, I wouldn't I don't think we are able to say that there's a specific strict time, you know, constraint. You get angry and by this number of hours you should have worked it out. I think a lot of times it's a lot easier for the intensity of anger to die down when there has been some resolution or when there is some indication of a resolution and a mm -hmm. way forward. Mm -hmm. So we will typically say that how long should a bout of anger last? A bout of anger should last for as long as you need to sit with it and process it, right? Mm -hmm. And that's different for different people. There are some people who, because of their, you know, where they are with their emotional regulation can process pretty quickly. Something happens, they immediately recognize they're angry, they know why they're angry, and so can process faster than most to get to a point to say, okay, yeah, I'm, I can have a conversation, right? And even though they recognize I'm still angry, I, I can control it enough to have a conversation. There are other people, and you know, and people run the gamut in terms of where they are with that. And then there, so there are other people who have such poor emotional regulation right that they can't right and so i think that is what we use to sort of set the parameters around how long a bout of anger should last for as long as you need to sit process with it and reach a point of okay this is where i see the way forward a conversation needs to happen or maybe in this case no conversation i need to maybe completely remove myself from the situation but some glimpse of a resolution right um but definitely for people who and the latter group, people who don't regulate well, um, it's also important to think about if you're if you are staying angry because once again, anger can lead to violence. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want us to gloss over that at all. Yes. People who regulate poorly a lot of times end up expressing their anger in ways that are harmful, right? And so from that lens, we'll say, okay, if a bout of anger, you're not processing, you're not figuring it out. There's danger because we don't know what, what you might do, right? So in that case, then something should be done to try and 
Got it. Cool you, cool you down. Yeah. But I think the standard answer to that is about a longer should last for as long as it takes for you to, to sit, process. process, and get to some point of resolution. So, even though I asked the question in relation to how long should it last, mm -hmm. I think the answer you've given me helps me understand that the longer it takes for someone to, to you know, bounce back into some kind of engagement is an indication of how the ability to emotionally regulate. Yeah. Is that a good way of thinking about it? That's one good way to think okay. about it. There's that, and then also sometimes it, it, it's an indication of how, in terms of what caused the intensity anger, of the anger, it, is, it could also be a, a intensity of the anger as well. That's fair. We all have things where we are angry, but we can get over it, get over it pretty quickly. Quickly, and the other but things. There are things that happen that will say, no, this one, it's not even fair to expect somebody to immediately be able to sit and talk about it because it's, it's a big thing, yeah. right? So I think it, it has to do with how well somebody emotionally regulates, definitely, or how comfortable they are um, emotionally regulating, but also in terms of what the cause of the anger is, how big or small um, yeah. it is. Yeah. And what might be big for me might not be big for Absolutely. Me. And I think that's what leads to a lot of conflict because sometimes even in friends- You're not equally yoked. You're not equally yoked. Or maybe even with a friend, right? Sometimes you don't understand why something has made them so angry because maybe for you it might be the thing that oh but this thing yeah it may make me angry but not that not angry. A big deal not a big deal but then for the for the person it, it might be because we're all different um yeah. in that regard another thought that strikes me as we talk about this is once you are in that conflict mode mm -hmm. right is are there things that a partner can do mm, mm. to help the one who's struggling oh, to good. bounce back that's good. and have a conversation. Because I know it's important to give the other person space. It's not always easy, no, it's not. right? Um, for someone like me, I want to have the conversation and no, I want to have it now, no. <laughs> right? And so one of the things I know I have to learn is to give someone space to kind of yeah think about it and also be willing to come to the table, right? Yeah. But are there things that you're able to do to help someone come and have that conversation? Oh, that's good. I think, I think emotional safety, you have to think about, especially if it's, if it's a close intimate relationship, you know your partner pretty well. Maybe you know the things that signal a sense of emotional safety for them. Because you see a, a conversation when we are angry or when we are processing any you know, intense, emotion right we are vulnerable yes. and anger actually is one of those anger is difficult because it's one of those emotions that seems really strong but actually when we are angry we are the most vulnerable because of what we talked about earlier in terms of anger is one of those emotions that quickly takes us from rational to irrational right so we are very very vulnerable so create thinking about what can I do to make my partner feel safe yes. enough to come and engage in this very vulnerable state they are in? Yes. And so definitely things you shouldn't do, right? Which, which we tend to do with our partners is sort of like um, some people who mock them. For example, maybe if your partner is crying, you know, being, why, are you crying? why are you crying? Being intentional about the things you are saying to them. Yeah. Are the things you are saying validating or invalidating what you see them experiencing? And even if you don't understand, are you able to offer empathy? Yeah. Right? I don't understand why this thing is making you cry, but I can clearly see you are in distress. And so even though I don't understand, can I be empathetic? Can I hold your hand? Can I hold your hand? Um, or some people will ask, um, what, what do you need in order to be able to have this conversation? Um, Things like that are helpful. I think the, the other thing to be mindful of is also this idea of being able to say, so So for the person who wants to talk about it, no, 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 right? Learning how to say, okay, let me give my partner some time. Yes, yes. What we say to the other person also is, um, but, but, no, but, but, but you also need to be able, f for the person you're saying, oh, the person who's saying, I need some space, they also need to be able to say to the person who wants to talk about it, no, no, no. I'll no, come no, back in three days. No, three days is fine. I'm just messing with you, but I'm saying, but, <laughs> but to tell you then, when I'll come back. 
as opposed to just leaving it wide, wide open, open because then that's also causing anxiety for, for you. The other person. Right. So thinking about what each person needs and where you can meet each other in the middle. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we won't talk about it right now, but maybe let's each take the day, right? Yeah. And then set a time, right? And say we'll talk about it at this time. And then it helps to give it some uh, structure, structure, right? Structure. And then when you come to talk about it too. You know, having rules around how you're going to talk about it. This bleeds a little into communication, but generally having rules that are based once again on emotional safety, right? Yes. As we're going to talk about it, no name calling. It, like, it, it's sad that you have to say, but no name calling, right? No sort of like hitting below the belt. People do that, like. Oh yeah, when when we are angry, there's a lot you Let can do. Uh -huh. So, <laughs> so <laughs> being intentional about no name calling. No hitting below the belt. No, it's not usually helpful to go and bring things that happened in the past. In up. the past to discuss the present, unless maybe you are using it to signify a pattern that you have noticed. But even then, even signifying then, that pattern exactly. in that conversation can be unhelpful. Can be unhelpful, right? And 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 when you absolutely have to do it, the way you do it is important. Mm -hmm. And then also in your anger, we tend to say, for example. Oh, you are such a selfish person. When maybe what I'm really trying to say is that in this instant, you are behaving in a very selfish, selfish way, way, right? Or we say things like, you always, we use these absolute words. Right. You always do this. You never do this. You are always like this. When we are really trying to say that in this instant, this, this is what, what you did. did. So definitely thinking about who your partner is, what their needs are, things that might signal emotional safety to them. Um, and then also thinking about safe ways to have that conversation. Oh, and then the, the last thing is also, I tell people when the first conversation you have when you're angry, the goal of that conversation shouldn't be um, resolution. Okay. That puts too much pressure on the conversation. Okay. The goal of that conversation should be for you to leave the door for another conversation, leave the door open for, for another hour. conversation. Interesting. Right? Because if we're trying to resolve in that one conversation, that's too much pressure. Especially when somebody is still probably still processing that. And anger. doesn't even understand what's going on. And they may not know when they end up when they are fully processed. Yeah. So the goal of the conversation should be, let's leave this conversation both willing to come back and have another conversation. Then, then you're in a good spot. I have some quotes. Okay. And then you tell me what your thoughts are. Okay. Um, the first one is, anger is an asset that can do more harm to the vessel in which it's stored mm -hmm. than to anything on which it's poured. Mark Twain. I agree with that. Okay. And I'll connect it back to what I said about how anger is hard on our bodies. Anger is one of those emotions that's really difficult for our bodies to carry. Okay. Right. So the person who's carrying the anger right a lot of harm can be done we've talked about some of what those things yeah. are um so i definitely agree with that first part um i do think that you know it, comparatively i don't know if it's more harmful to carry it than to ex because you know people who've been on the receiving end of people's anger man also struggle with it <laughs> yes True. anger can be destructive um so i don't know if i'd, I'd agree necessarily that one is more than the other. Yeah. But I do definitely agree that when you carry anger, it's really hard, hard on your body. I, I, I think, you know, one of the conversations we I had was how kids are raised and a kid's ability to regulate is also based on the ability, whether when they were growing up, it was safe for them to express their emotions, right? And when you're growing up in an environment where there's a lot of anger or there's a lot of shouting and, you know, unregulated emotions you're constantly trying to figure out how is mom feeling how is dad feeling you know that whole prayer and that is not necessarily an easy mm -hmm. space to hold right mm -hmm. so uh, there's a lot of anxiety that comes with that right so i when when we talk about on the vessel in which it's poured mm -hmm. i think there's also a significant mm -hmm. impact on that vessel mm -hmm. right Absolutely. you know and that's why i say i can't agree Holy, Holy in terms of that one is more, more than, than, than the other. other. I think okay. damage is, is harmful to both. Both, yeah. Um, the next one is for every minute you remain angry, you give up 60 seconds of peace of mind. Ralph Waldo Emerson. <laughs> and there's true true without it. <laughs> there's no peace of mind. <laughs> so definitely, when you're in the state of you're definitely um, losing out on some peace of mind. Um, you, you alluded to this already. 
where you talked about don't let the sun go down on your anger. So in Ephesians, it says, be angry, mm -hmm. but do not sin. Yeah. Do not let the sun go down on your anger yeah. and give no opportunity to the devil. Yeah. And I think that there, it's quite a loaded verse in many it ways. It your thoughts? You know, the first part I really, really like because I think it acknowledges that you know, anger is a valid emotion, right? Because it says be angry. So there are situations in which, yes, we absolutely have a right to be angry. And, but then it says do not sin. And, and I, I interpret that to mean separating the feeling of the emotion from the expression of it. Because I think where, where we tend to sin is when we're expressing that anger in you know, violent and destructive ways. They're not letting the sun go down on your anger. That one, I'm still struggling with. <laughs> <laughs> so five minutes to six o'clock, I'm angry. <laughs> However, you know, I heard someone, I can't remember who, but I heard someone talk about it in terms of they interpret not letting the sun go down on your anger to do with whether or not you are able to act. I think a lot of people interpret it to mean that you should have resolved the issue before we sleep. Okay. I, I saw, I, can't, I, think, I think it was something I watched that talked about how another interpretation could be that it may not be that you find resolution, right? Or, but, but maybe you, you make it a point and commit to, okay, I won't go to sleep until I have maybe more internally, you know, acknowledged and thought about, maybe come to some determination about how I'm going to resolve it, or come to some determination about, I am going to resolve this thing. I'm just not maybe able to do it before, sort of like the sun, the sun goes down. But I think it's one of those things that I've heard people give different interpretations to. Um, but yeah, to be honest, I, I, don't, I, I don't quite know what to, to make of that last bit. But I definitely see that people struggle with it a lot. What, are, what, so, what do you make What of do it? I think? Yeah, what do you think? So I do definitely agree with the idea that be angry, but mm -hmm. do not sin. Mm -hmm. And you are, you, you are definitely right. It's, I'm upset about this. This is uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And even Jesus got angry. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's in the expression of what you do with that anger. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it's yeah. in the way you exhibit how you're feeling in that moment. Um, when it talks about not letting the sun go down on your anger, I kind of look at it from an intensity perspective. Okay, okay. I agree okay. with you that you can't resolve everything, mm -hmm. you know, almost instantly, but you were boiling at a 10 out of 10. Mm -hmm and you're going to bed, are mm -hmm. you boiling at that 10, 10 out of 10? 10. 10. Yeah. And are you going to sleep? Are you going to be able to lay your head down and sleep? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or are you going to toss and turn, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it's the impact, impact of, of the intensity of how you're feeling, feeling that anger. Yeah. 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 Are you make, taking steps towards resolving it? Mm -hmm. Or are you saying, we'll come back and we'll have this conversation, right? Yeah. Whatever it is, how is it making, how are you holding it and how is it making you feel? feel? Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's also about that self-destructive nature of mm -hmm. anger mm -hmm. and about what it does to you more than what it does to everybody yeah, else around you. you. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 And I think that it being a seed that allows you to think in different directions and behave in certain ways mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. what gives roots to the devil. Right. And right, so right. don't let not you not, you know, holding on to it indefinitely. Mm -hmm, and, you know, mm -hmm. is where it says, because that's when you get angrier. Mm -hmm, oh, mm -hmm. she did this. Yeah. Can you imagine? imagine. Yeah. You yeah. should get back at yeah. her. Yeah. You should yeah. feel this way. This is yeah. how you should react. This yeah. is how you should respond. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's where you're given the room, the, the room and the root. Right. Yeah, and that's how I interpret I it. I agree. I agree. I think that's a beautiful interpretation. It actually made me think of um, my dad. One of the things my dad does is when, and I remember he would do this with us and with my mom, when he's angry, especially, I think he interpreted it as, I, if I'm going to, I shouldn't go to sleep angry, yes. right? So I think he would work really hard on reducing the intensity. Yes. And then whoever he was angry with, he would be intentional about saying to the person, I'm angry, I still love you, 
we'll talk about it later. Okay. So I think in his mind, because I think he connected it to, and I think he said this once to us, okay, I'm angry with you, I go to bed and I don't wake up. What happened? What happened? So then he was super intentional about it, yeah, saying I'm angry, but then he would always follow it up with, but I love you. Yes. Sort of like just giving yes. that reassurance and then saying we'll talk about it tomorrow. And I think that's how he made peace with the not letting the sun go, go down, down on, on, your, your anger. on your anger. Yeah. But I also, I, I definitely, definitely love what you've shared in terms of the intensity. Yeah. I, I, and, 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 and there are times when, I remember the first time I went to bed without reconnecting with my daughter. It was one of the hard, hardest things for me. Yeah, but there was something that I had to do because mm -hmm. she had gotten so used to, oh, mommy, you yeah. know, we'll get over we'll get it, over right? It quickly. And she actually did feel it, right? Because mm -hmm. the, the following day, the first thing she said was, you went to bed and you didn't say good night. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, but, you know, it, it's a thing I, regardless of what's happening, I need to be able to say, I love you, I care about you, you mean the world to me, yes. but this is how I'm feeling yes. and we will deal talk with it. We yeah. will talk yes. about it. Um, final question. Okay. Let's do how it. do we manage anger? Mm -hmm. Anger management. You make <laughs> breathe and count to ten. Breathe and count to ten. Um, <laughs> that's, that's what we've all kind of seen. Yeah. How do we manage anger? I'm really glad you were using the word manage um, because I think it, it has to start with self-awareness, right? I think everyone, after listening to this conversation, I want you to take a moment to pause and spend some time really thinking about what is my relationship with anger, right? What do I know in terms of the things that make me angry? How I tend to behave when I'm angry? How long I stay angry? Just spending some time really thinking about where, I, where you are at with your relationship with anger, right? Because that's where management of anything starts from, a certain level of, of self-awareness, right? So that, that's the first step. And then depending on what you discover, Right, you might find that, huh? Maybe I do really well on the internal regulation bit. I don't do well when it comes to the expression of it. So maybe I need to, you know, work on healthier ways to express my anger. Or then you might discover, huh? I can't even recognize when I'm angry. Yes. Um, and with that, the starting point, I think, once again, like I was saying, and I, and I really share this document with you, and you can think about how you can make it available. Our bodies tell us. Right? So if you're having a hard time recognizing anger, right, your body will tell you what emotion you're feeling. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where it has to start. Um, because when you can recognize, then you can do a better job of sitting with it, which is you know, exploring why I'm angry, why am I feeling this way, um, and going through that whole process. So awareness, figuring out where you are, whether you need to work on the internal bit or the expression bit, but also sort of like thinking about what your perception of anger is and how it's been modeled for you and thinking about, do I have preconceived or pre-decided sort of like notions and feelings about what anger is and where anger should show up. So like challenging just your whole relationship with anger. with anger, your thoughts, your feelings, your perspectives, whatever it might be. And then maybe starting to keep what when, when we're working with clients and we're, we're trying to get them to, to build a better relationship with a specific emotion, you may ask them to keep, you can decide to keep an anger journal, right? And one of the things you do in the anger journal is every encounter you have with anger, you write it down. Because what you start, you write it down, you write what made you angry, what you noticed in terms of how it impacted you, what you said, what you did, how you felt, everything. Because what that will do is you'll start to notice patterns. patterns. And patterns do not lie, right? And patterns are powerful in helping you figure out, okay, where is the source of this, this thing, yeah. right? So you can, you can, you can keep an, an anger journal for, yeah. for, for a couple of weeks and kind of see what you start to discover. Um, if you find that you are at the point where your anger is uncontrollable, get help. And you are caught, get help. Yeah. and you are causing harm to people around you. We don't have, at that point, we don't have time for you to now go digging and waiting. Um, get help, get help, because what that help will prioritize, getting you to pause the harmful behavior first 
and then we'll start digging deeper in terms of what is at the root of it. But if you're at the point where your anger is causing distraction, we want to stop that distraction first. And that's where things like, with a lot of anger management, removing yourself from the situation, if you can. If you realize I'm the kind of person I get angry, when I get angry, I'm not at the point yet where I can control myself. The focus on removing yourself from the situation. If you're going into a situation, and this is why self-awareness is important, because if you know your triggers and you're going into a particular situation where you know some triggers might be present, then have an accountability partner, right? In signal to somebody that, Charlie, as soon as this person shows up or as soon as this person says something, get me out of there, yeah. right? Practical things like that. And that's where the, you know, counting to 10, because what, what counting to 10 does is it gives you a moment to pause between what you're feeling and the action you're about to take. take. And in that, way, in that way, pauses are powerful, right? Because emotions demand action. So when we are angry, it's our minds immediately go to, I need to take some action. So giving yourself a pause, counting to 10, breathing, focusing on your breathing, removing yourself from the situation. I'm a big believer in remove yourself from the situation, right? Until you get to the point where you know and you're confident in your ability to regulate. There's nothing weak or nothing wrong about I'm leaving, <laughs> right? Or I'm not staying in the presence of this thing because I don't want to do something destructive. Ultimately, if you can get help, and by help I mean if you can work with a, you know, a professional mental health, um, you know, a mental health professional, then that is the best way to somebody who can guide you and, and help you navigate through that. Thank you. Thank you too. I'll make great. you a cocktail. Yay! The best part. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you know it's your best part. <laughs> so, given that you're not a cocktail person and you're a mocktail person. <laughs> I appreciate you accommodating that. Shall I go there ahead? We go. Okay. Oops. No, I'll get that for you. There you go. Stir Cheers. it up. Yay. Let's see. You know the rules already. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay. So there is either ginger ale. You got that right. <laughs> but it's it's like you just came to <laughs> okay. the ginger ale. Uh huh. There is ice. <laughs> <laughs> there's definitely ice the color where's the color from there is is there some kind of... there's no in there no no <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're digging in your memory bank mm. don't dig, dig in your memory bank Okay, there's ginger ale, definitely. There is... Is there cranberry? No, there no. isn't. Cheers, okay, stir cheers. it up. Okay. So there's Tell ginger me. ale, mm -hmm. there's strawberry, there's... And then there's soda water. Oh, okay. So I got one out of four. That's poor. Poor showing. <laughs> it's not. It's not a poor showing at all. Thank you so much for coming, Carol. I appreciate you.